I'm sorry that I have limited ability in French. That said, I have the greatest of respect for the French language, the French culture, including the civil law tradition, the Quebecois, and other French-speaking Canadians. If my nomination is approved, I will do everything in my power in the years ahead to become more proficient in the French language. You know, I woke up, uh, Mr. Justice Moldaver, at about uh, 3.30 this morning, uh, considering how I was going to cross-examine you today. Um, and it's not easy, but um, I'm sure you're aware um, that it's your appointment um, that has the, the controversy around it um, because of your lack of uh, capability in the French language. I understand that you're not able to speak French at all. <laughs> the statements that you read today, yeah. I assume, had been prepared and you were reading those statements. That's today. correct, sir. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Justice Mulder, I mean, it's really interesting. We see the, the comparison here between the two candidates. Um, was there any advantage that Madam Justice Karakatsanis had in terms of learning French that was not available to you? No, sir, there wasn't. Okay. And. With regard, uh, I just want to go back to the controversy. We've had editorials in the, uh, some of the newspapers in Quebec. We've had the Barreau du Quebec um, pressing the government to reconsider your nomination. Um, uh, we certainly have had the Commissioner of Official Languages, who's been very clear over a number of years now that it is an absolute requirement. It's, a, it's one of the qualities. We listened to Professor Hogg as to what the qualities are of a judge. According to the Commissioner of Official Languages, uh, one of those qualities is the ability to be able to work in French and in English when you're sitting on the highest court of this country. I followed your career. I have no questions about your ability, um, except for that one, for me, crucial element. So what do we say? What, what do you say to the, to the <clears throat> province of Quebec, to the francophony communities across the country? Well, thank you, Mr. Cromart. And that's a very, very important question, and I take it very seriously, I assure you. Um, my uh, lack of fluency at the present time in French will clearly make my task that much harder on the court. But I'm not even so worried so much worried about me. I feel that, and I understand exactly the concern, uh, certainly from counsel who appear before the court and who wish to speak in the French language and who um, understandably would want a judge that can engage with them in the French language, which I readily admit at this time I cannot do. That said, I can only commit to you that I will be uh, taking up, obviously, uh, uh, I, I will be studying and I'll be learning and I'll be uh, meeting with someone, obviously, to learn French as, as quickly as I can. Um, there is simultaneous translation, which obviously will be of assistance to me. I will be, uh, have available law clerks who can assist me uh, in, in understanding uh, factums and so on that are filed in French. I will have obviously colleagues who can assist me and all I can say sir is that I'll do everything I can in my power to get far, as proficient as I can in the French language as quickly as possible. Um, I, I respect uh, the question. Uh, I respect very much the views of the uh, Quebecois and, and uh, uh, I am what I am uh, I uh, will just do everything I can, as I said in my opening, to try and get as proficient as I can as quickly as possible. I can't do more than that, sir. Je ne sais pas euh, à ce niveau-là comment vous pouvez me rassurer, Monsieur Juge Moldaver, mais avec avec ce que j'ai dans le dossier concernant euh, le fait qu'il n'y a pas eu d'effort de 90 à aller jusqu'à maintenant, et, 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 et je me pose la question, est-ce que vous croyez que les gens qui vont devant la Cour suprême ont le droit d'être entendus dans la langue de leur choix et que les juges devraient comprendre ce dont ils parlent, autant les, 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 les juristes que euh, les, ce qu'il y a dans le dossier? 
My simple answer to you, Madam Levin, in terms of why I did not further my French. Why didn't I do it when I had the opportunity? Quite simply, I never expected to be here. Not in my wildest dreams, never, ever. And, and if someone had given me a crystal ball when I was in university or whatever and said, you're going to be someday before a committee and have a very important question put to you like the one that you just raised, believe me, I would not have squandered those years. We have wonderful, wonderful training for judges. Mm -hmm. And there were times that I thought I would like to just take it up and then other things got in the way and so on. And, but the simple answer is I never thought I would be here. Labor, have you set yourself a time limit as to when you'll be uh, uh, have a fluency, a working fluency in the French language? Do I? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Have you set yourself a timeline within which you will be fluent in the French language as far as a working knowledge of it? I can only say this, Mr. Cromart, and I don't. I will never make a promise I can't keep. I will. I will. I can promise you that I will try and get at this as quickly as I possibly can. I have. There. It gives me no joy. To, to be sitting here and, and you know, feeling that, um, you know, I'm not going to be able for some time to be able to engage in a case in French. So I'll just do the best I can. That's all I can do. I take great pride in my career as a nonpartisan professional public servant. I was first appointed by Premier Peterson uh, as chair and CEO of the Liquor License Board. I was reappointed by Premier Ray, and I was appointed a deputy minister and then head of the public service by Premier Harris. I'm proud of having received premier appointments from the leaders of three different political parties. Now, how has it helped me? Um, I just think having a better understanding of, of uh, how uh, government works, how laws are made, the, the care that goes into um, reaching these important decisions that you make. Uh, I've uh, seen firsthand how the public service uh, gives full and um, um, you know, really not good nonpartisan professional policy advice. I've seen the public service implement decisions of government, understanding that everybody has a role. It's elected officials who make the decisions, the public service that gives the advice, but then implements those decisions. So it just, for me, has really reinforced the fact that everybody has an important role to play. And we all have to carry out our own roles and respect the roles of the others. Uh, just one question to you again. Um, with your... Uh experience, a fairly lengthy experience, and that other pillar of government on the administrative side. Um, has it ever given you any cause for concern when you're making decisions that you may tend to favor a government side over individual plaintiffs or claimants? Uh, no, I'm sorry. To, no, I think that's directed yeah, to me. Sure. Yes. And the answer is absolutely not. I approach each and every case um, with um, the view to doing the right thing according to the law and the facts and the case before me. And sometimes cases turn out differently than you might expect. Uh, sometimes they might turn out differently than you might even have wanted to find, especially on the trial court where the facts sometimes seem to go one way um, initially and then and move. I, I do not believe that has, has ever been an influence for me to say there is one party that I favor over another. I take each case as it comes, I do the very best I can in each case, and whatever the right decision is, I'll make it. I will make it. I, I very much value um, my integrity, my independence of thought, and I take my oath very seriously. Madam Justice uh, Karakatsanis, I, I, I have a question. So I'll try to put delicately, but it's in the public domain, so I, I, I'm repeating something that's, uh, 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 that's already out there. But I do note that your experience is a little different than others. You have a strong public law background, which I think is, is good. Um, and, um, but your experience on the Court of Appeal is a year and a half, although I do note that you 
of the 27 cases that you sat on with your colleagues, you wrote 10 of the decisions, so I'm not — the work ethic is obviously uh, clearly there. Uh, but, you know, some of your uh, — of our legal confreres, uh, uh, perhaps uh, — and I'm not talking about partisans, I'm talking about law professors and some commentators — said, well, you know, They've overlooked uh, some big brains on the Court of Appeal in Ontario, and, and you know, she, she's not got this much experience. Um, and some of them go so far as to name the other people who are sort of uh, uh, perhaps more qualified uh, by their experience and, and uh, whatnot, almost given the sense that you're — that you're jumping the queue here somehow. And I want to know, first of all, how does that make you feel as a, as a person now going to the Supreme Court of Canada? And uh, how do you respond to that in terms of, of uh, what it is that, that uh, you bring to the table here? Well, how does it make me feel? I have to say that I feel very humbled. As I said uh, to uh, um, Madame, I think it's Maître Bourgoivin, um, that, um, you know, sometimes people are appointed to the uh, Court of Appeal who are, have not been trial judges. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada who have not been judges at all. Parliament has given judges the awesome responsibility to ensure that government acts in accordance with the Canadian Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms. But we do so with respect recognizing that it is the responsibility of elected officials to make the difficult public policy decisions and to make the difficult decisions about how to spend public funds. Of course, if the law violates the Charter, it must be struck down. This is the role that Parliament has given to the judiciary. Judges have a tremendous responsibility to apply the law impartially and with an open mind and fearlessly, in accordance with the law and precedent. We must embody and protect the fundamental values of our Canadian community in accordance with our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Since the advent of the Charter in 1982, judges have been given the authority to strike down laws enacted by Parliament, provincial legislatures, and other government bodies to the extent that the laws in question failed to conform to the provisions of the Charter. That power is an awesome one, and it places a tremendous responsibility on judges to act responsibly. We are not above the law. On the contrary, like the executive and legislative branches of government, we too are bound by the law. Under the rule of law, it is not our function to create laws, nor do we have the right to direct governments on matters of policy. Under the Constitution, we have been given the authority to determine the legality of laws passed by Parliament and the legislatures. In fulfilling that role, we must never lose sight of the fact that we are being asked to strike down laws that have been enacted by a democratically elected majority of parliamentarians. The need for caution and restraint in these circumstances is self-evident. But the ramifications of our decisions must never prevent us from acting fearlessly in accordance with the mandate we have been given. That is our sworn duty, and we must abide by it. I'm wondering if uh, you would be able to comment, obviously without getting too specific, but uh, how a court of law should address a situation where individual rights and collective rights may, um, may come up, up against each other. Uh, the Charter is the one area where um, you know, certain different values do come uh, uh, into play. And, um, Often you can look at uh, the facts and the, and, the, um, and the record and there may be a way that you can respect all values without um, in any way um, uh, uh, losing, without in any way uh, losing uh, an important value. Um, there has uh, been a body of jurisprudence developed 
over the past couple of decades that has a uh, analytical framework that uh, um, first you have to look to see if there's a way that different values can coexist uh, and, and be accommodated, both of them, so that you can give full effect. There are, there's no hierarchy of values. You have to look at each value in the context of the whole. Um, there may be, uh, if, if inevitable, and y y that, that there will be some, um, some give and take, you try to do it in a way that will minimally impair the rights. So it, this is a, I guess there's just a rigorous analytical framework, and you just have to work your way through it, and you work your way through it after you've read all of the facts, the factual context, you've read the documents, you've read the case law, often academic work, and you work your way through it. It's, um, it, it, it's not a situation where you, you can just stand back and say, well, this is what I feel. Uh, because they're all very important rights. And uh, the law requires that we have to go through a process to ensure that we address them as fully as possible without uh, compromising uh, any rights, if at all possible, and if necessary, that it be done in the minimal way uh, possible. Coming, my immigrant heritage uh, has helped me to um, be a little more sensitive to different cultures, to understand diversity a little bit more, the challenges that immigrants face. I think it just, it, it, it helps, I think, in terms of empathy, understanding that people come from different places, they have different views, different perspectives. It's, a, it's another way of having an open mind, really. So I think that it just is so much a part of who I am uh, that uh, it's hard to say it's going to help me specifically in one way or another. Um, it's really just about respect, respecting people um, for their differences as well as uh, celebrating what we have in common. Yes, that if we look at the law, for example, in the criminal law, collective rights, individual rights, and we see it as a spectrum, and on one end we have law and order and we have protection of society and at the other end of the spectrum we have individual rights and civil liberties. Um, and at various times and places in, in, in our jurisprudence the law might swing a little bit more that way or it might swing a little bit more the other way. The beauty of Canada though is that we don't, we, we are not a country of extremes. There are certain parameters within which we all act. There are certain things that are just simply unacceptable to Canadians. And if the law and order side goes beyond what the courts feel are the proper bounds, then we have to send a message back to Parliament that you've gone too far. But, but, but the beauty of our country is, is that that's not what we're all about as Canadians. And so while someone might be a little upset that it the law's gone a little too far this way or a little too far that way. It's always within certain appropriate boundaries. But it, it's a little worrisome that uh, you appear to be, have a, a reputation for discouraging uh, charter challenges. Well, thank you for that question. I, again, it's a very important question. And uh, to the extent that the label is, I have either purposely or in its effect tried to discourage charter challenges is, with great respect, completely wrong. Uh, I have never discouraged charter challenges and, and if you were to look at the addresses in question, I have made it abundantly clear that uh, council are perfectly entitled to raise charter matters. Um, and all I really ever wanted to do was just say, just think about these charter applications because I have been part of the criminal law for now a lot of years and I have seen criminal trials go from being murder trials seven days long, sexual assaults two days long, to murder trials becoming seven months long, sometimes years long, sexual assaults going on forever. And I'm not the only one that has talked about this, by the way. Uh, the late Chief Justice Lemaire was concerned about it. Our present Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada has talked about it. The Honourable Mr. Justice Binney, when he just uh, it, it recently talked about it. I just don't want abuses. The people that I was talking about, 
I was not broad stroking and never intended to broad stroke the defense bar. And I say that and I stand by it. That was never, ever my intention. The lecture that I gave, by the way, was the Sapinka lecture. And, and the Honorable John Sapinka was a great friend and one of the greatest judges in this country. And the lecture was on advocacy. And I took the opportunity to say in the context of that lecture that, number one, um, the criminal trials were spinning out of control. And part of the problem was charter motions being brought that really there was not a lot of thought being given to. And, and, and my first point was, so please be discerning. Don't look at the charter as your own personal genie in the bottle. That's what I said in the talk. But beyond that, the talk was about advocacy. Good advocates do not throw up everything in front of a trial judge and hope that something sticks. That is not good advocacy. In, in terms, though, of the complexity and prolixity or length of trials, again, with great respect, if you look at what I said, I said this is not a problem that is singular to the defense bar. This is a problem that everybody, all the stakeholders have to take responsibility for. Crowns, judges, members of parliament, police, everybody that is a part of the system. And I didn't want to throw stones at anybody. I wanted people to come together to make our justice system better, to work better uh, for a common goal. That was what I had in mind. It got, unfortunately, taken the wrong way. And I was accused of being a charter basher and so on and so forth. And I responded. And I responded forcefully because with great respect, when someone impugns my professional integrity, I'm going to do what I can to restore it. Now, let me just finish with one thing. Um, the, the, the main complaint at the time, as I recall it, that everything I'm saying is just anecdotal. It wasn't anecdotal to me. I'm sitting in the appeal court every day seeing transcripts going up to the ceiling. I knew what was going on. Uh, but if there is any vindication needed for the concerns that I had, because 1 percent of the bar can make a mess of the justice system. Just 1 percent or 2 percent or 3 percent, they can cause a drain on the justice system that is enormous. And if you just please anybody who, if there's any vindication needed, I commend to you the the, the Lesage and Code Report, the Honorable Patrick Lesage, Michael Code, now the Honorable Mr. Justice Code of the Superior Court, um, uh, they uh, uh, made it perfectly clear that what I had described or what, what people were accusing me of just talking anecdotally, they made it clear this is not anecdotal. There are some abuses out there and they have to be uh, dealt with. That said, uh, abuses by the Crown or the police or anybody else have to be dealt with. And including the trial courts and the courts of appeal, we have to be alive to all this. We've got to just work together. My intention was not to demean anybody, certainly not the defense bar that I was a member of for 17 years. I wanted to try and make the justice system a little bit better. That's all that was behind it. I practiced law in a way that I didn't really want to go to trial on any sort of a serious case unless I believed or at least had a reasonable doubt in the innocence of my client. And that is not the traditional view, but that is the way I practiced because if I didn't have that belief in my client, I could not speak properly to juries. I could not be sincere. I could not, my voice would change if I was arguing something that I really didn't believe in. Yes. I think the most important decision probably in the history of our charter is the Stinchcomb decision written by the Honorable Justice, late Justice John Sapinka. And I think most of the miscarriage or many of the miscarriages in justice in this country have been because there has not been full and complete disclosure. And, and, and uh, the Stinchcomb case obviously made it very clear that uh, disclosure uh, is vital. And, and if the defense has all the relevant matters, then the chances of there being a miscarriage of justice go down considerably. In my case, I worked for a number of summers on the road gang, fixing and repaving the streets of Peterborough. 
The work I did was mostly pick and shovel, and it was hard work on a hot summer day with the asphalt coming off the truck at seven or eight hundred degrees Fahrenheit, I can assure you it was no picnic. You won't be surprised to hear that my first job was in the family restaurant during <laughs> school years. It's a great teaching ground for learning to work hard and to work cooperatively. And I learned how to be polite and civil even when customers were not at their very best. <laughs> As a passionate Canadian, I would be proud to serve this country as a member of its highest court. I would be thrilled to have the opportunity for such important and challenging work with the talented and dedicated judges on the Supreme Court of Canada. If appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada, I will discharge this public trust to the very best of my abilities. And I consider it a great honour to have been nominated as a candidate for the Supreme Court of Canada. If my nomination is approved, I promise that I will serve the people of Canada to the best of my ability with dedication and integrity.